I'm June Gruber, an Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Colorado Boulder and Director of this Mental Health Experts series. I'm here today with Dr. Jacqueline Persons, Director of the Oakland Cognitive Behavior Therapy Center and Clinical Professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of California, Berkeley. Thanks for being here today, Jackie. Oh, thank you, June. I was wondering if you could tell me just a little bit um, about the kind of mental health work you do. I do several types of work, which is uh, fun. I like to be able to do a bunch of different things. So my main identity is as a practitioner. So I see probably eight to 10 patient hours a week. I was gonna say in my office, but now it's all virtual. I do, uh, somehow I've moved into doing a, a considerable amount of consultation for clinicians. Uh, I do some research which I have fun doing. I am doing some teaching now over at UC Berkeley. I'm teaching cognitive behavior therapy to the clinical science students. I often am doing clinical supervision over there. I do workshop trainings. I used to kind of go around the world and do that, but these days, not so much. I think that's the whole different range of, of things I'm doing. And I mean, it's such an impressive array of, of work you're doing. And I just wonder, how did you go about getting started in this work? Oh, I forgot to mention a couple other things I'm doing, which is uh, kind of like professional service. I head up a committee for the Society for Science of Clinical Psychology, which I'm passionate about. And so my committee is called Committee on Science in Practice. I'm also serving for the APA on the advisory steering committee for our clinical practice guidelines. So now I'm ready to think about how did I get started? Well, it, to be completely honest, I of course didn't actually visualize this path when I started. And, I, and to be completely honest, the way it happened was that I'm, my husband is an academic at about, and I was trained, I felt like I went to the University of Pennsylvania, which is kind of like this program here at UC Berkeley. The goal of the training is to train academics. So I felt like I was supposed to be an academic, but at the time it would have been right for me to go on the academic job market. My husband was also on the academic job market and he got a fabulous offer all but tenure here at UC Berkeley. And so we came to Berkeley. And uh, so then I had to figure it out. Okay, Jackie, what are you gonna do? Uh, so I, for a short time, I looked for a job, then I, but I didn't get one, then I realized, oh, I think it's because I don't actually wanna work for anybody else. <laughs> so I started my practice. I started doing clinical work, which I do enjoy. And then I had three or four or five papers, the data for which I had collected during my training that I started writing up. And so then I started doing research. I started thinking about my work and developing my case formulation ideas. And uh, what can I say? I just kept going like that. And as, you, as you're saying, kept going throughout the course of a really amazing successful career you had and, have been, and will continue to have, what frustrations and failures have you encountered along the way, as well as the successes you've savored? Maybe I could think about the successes first. That's kind of the most fun part. Um, yeah. I feel very fortunate and um, blessed actually in these days of awareness of um, privilege. I cannot even tell you how privileged I have been to um, have grown up as I did receive the education that I did and have the opportunities I've had to develop my ideas and, and develop my scholarship. So I just feel so fortunate in ways that I wasn't really fully aware of, I would say until recently. Uh, and I've been very fortunate to have had some ability to get some professional support for my work. So in a certain way, I've been alone in a certain way. Being a clinician who does research particularly is kind of lonely. So maybe that's a hard part and a frustration. 
it's kind of lonely. At the same time, it's kind of cool and exciting. And uh, I have a professional home at the ABCT, also at the SSCP that supports it. And I've been elected to be president of both those groups, which is like a really big honor. My books have been very successful and, and well, well re uh, received. So that's gratifying that I would sit in my office and have ideas about my cases and my work that is helpful to other people. That's been gratifying and rewarding. The hard part is it's kind of lonely. Like I don't understand why other clinicians who have the research training that I do don't also do research. I would like to have more colleagues to work with along these lines. I have found some fantastic groups. Uh, a small group of us have put together our own IRB. But it's but it's been kind of lonely. I would say that's that's the hard part. Um, and it's both the but often, as you know, that's the downside and upside simultaneously. It's lonely and like people look at me and they say, "Oh, Jackie, you're so unusual." I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and as you think about um, looking ahead in your own career and in the field of mental health and cognitive behavior therapy. What do you see as the most important next steps? Next steps for, for me in my, in my own work? Yeah, and in the field too. In the field. Well, well maybe to answer both those questions, like the move away from diagnosis, like RDOCs, and the move away from diagnosis, although diagnosis is important, so I feel like I can't let it go completely, but RDOCS gives me permission as a clinician and also in developing my ideas and my um, ideas about case formulation to think about transdiagnostic mechanisms. So the field is moving in that way, in a way that's helpful. I would say it seems pretty clear we're going to be doing more video work than we did before. It also does seem pretty clear we need to think more about um, how to uh, think about and provide effective care for underserved populations. So those are important things for us to think about. In my own work, I'm trying to, I have some work I'm doing. Oh, the thing I'm doing that I'm really excited about is because I'm starting to come to the end of my career and I'm trying to think about what legacy do I want to leave behind. So I'm working here with my colleague here at the Oakland Cognitive Behavior Therapy Center to develop an infrastructure that supports data collection, data collection that guides the clinical work and can be used for research because I want to help other clinicians do that too. And so we're working to build our own system, which actually is kind of hard, but, and uh, to write up some papers so we can help other people do the same. That's amazing. What an amazing model to and template for others to follow. Well, thank you, June. I would say one of my most favorite things in the entire world is I'm sitting in my office. All of these days, of course, I'm sitting in my office and the patient is somewhere else in the world. And, um, and I'm collecting data. I should think a little bit more about how to collect video data because of course it's all there just waiting. I just need to push the record button and get a release from the patient to do it. So, but so I'm sitting in my office working with my patient collecting data that's useful for the clinical enterprise. And if the patient is giving permission for me to do that, which most of my patients will, also useful for research. That is the coolest thing in the world. So what advice would you have for those who may be watching this interview today who are interested in the field and maybe want to get engaged? Well, actually, now I'm thinking about the other question you just asked, which is where is the field going? I'm hoping the field of clinical psychology and mental health more generally is continuing to move in the direction of evidence-based care and, an, and a high value placed on evidence. Unfortunately, our larger culture isn't necessarily supporting that, but so we may have a more of an uphill battle than we would have liked. Um, but certainly for young people coming along, I would 
encourage them to stay careful and thoughtful. I know in my own training, I was trained as a scientist, and then I'm presented with these options for clinical learning and skill development that actually are not firmly evidence-based. And I know I was talking to a clinician here in the San Francisco Bay Area some years ago. I said to him, oh, the reason I became a cognitive behavior therapist is because I was paying attention to the evidence. He said, really? By which he meant many clinicians do not do that. You know, they pay attention to who the people in their clinical world, they respect what they do, what ideas capture them. Pay attention to data, I would say to you, if you're being trained as a clinical scientist, if you're being trained as a mental health professional, because learning these skills is so difficult. Don't learn just any old set of skills. Learn skills that have an evidence base. Please, this would be my plea. <laughs> Jackie, thank learn you. Skills that have, could I also say learn yeah. skills that have an evidence base and also collect data and think about making a scientific contribution if you, like many of us, have been trained to do that because otherwise, all these data are slipping away and you, many clinicians have so many good ideas, put them out into the world, collect some data, publish a paper and make a larger contribution. So that's my other piece of advice for the young person. And I will stop talking and stop interrupting you. Oh, it's been so wonderful to talk with you, Jackie. I feel your words of wisdom are just so, so important, so timely and I know always valuable to trainees in the field, including myself when I was your trainee. So really grateful for your time today. Thank you, June. Thank you, Jackie.